Hello everyone, and welcome to this series on fractional calculus. In this video, we're going to discuss some of the underlying questions that are very important when studying fractional calculus, starting with the question, what exactly is fractional calculus, and why should we care about it? I'm also going to explain a couple of very misinterpretations and some things that I have seen in literature and in social media that have actually been portrayed incorrectly. So I just want to sort of address them firstly um, throughout this video just to make sure that there is no confusion about those things. So let's just get started with a basic review of some of the basic things from integer order calculus that you definitely already should be familiar with. For example, the power rule. So we should already know that if r is a real number, usually it's not equal to zero, but it doesn't really matter here, uh, the derivative of x to the power of r is equal to r times x to the r minus one. So this is what we refer to as the power rule. There's also a couple other rules that you can derive. For example, the fourth derivative of sine of x is equal to itself, sine of x. Um, we also have the second derivative of, let's say, hyperbolic cosine. We know that that's equal to hyperbolic cosine. And let's assume that n is a natural number. Then the nth derivative of e to the lambda x is going to be equal to lambda to the power of m e to the lambda x, and let's again assume that lambda is a, let's assume it's a positive real number. So those are some of the basic rules that you definitely should already know from uh, basic level calculus. So in the world of fractional calculus, we want to ask questions, for example, what is the third derivative of, for example, tangent? What is the pith derivative of I don't know, e to the x. Or what is the ith derivative, where i is a complex number, of, I don't know, the absolute value of x, or something like that. So fractional calculus seeks to extend the order of a derivative to any real number, not just integers. Now, with that basic question at least stated, let's just discuss a very important note that you need to understand. So if someone claims that, for example, the alpha th derivative of some function f of x is equal to g of x without specifying the meaning of d alpha dx alpha, and some people will represent that as just d alpha, then this interpretation then the statement is generally ambiguous. There's actually several different interpretations of this fractional differential operator d alpha. So it's possible that d alpha of f of x is equal to g of x, and if you choose another fractional differential operator d alpha, then it will give you some other function. For example, this could also be equal to h of x, where h and g are not equal to each other. So the fractional differential operator, at least in the present time, can take several different forms depending on what you're actually trying to achieve. So let's just do a little basic examples to sort of illustrate what I mean. So let's assume that the eighth derivative with respect to x of sine of x is equal to cosine of x. And let's assume that the bth derivative of sine of x is equal to minus cosine of x. And let's assume that both of these are first order derivatives. But we don't exactly know what dA and dB, the operators, represent. They just represent operators, and I'm not really defining them. Well, this first operator appears to be the standard derivative, right? That looks like just the derivative of sine x. But this other one almost looks like the antiderivative of sine of x, right? But if you look a little bit closely, negative cosine x and cosine of x are actually really close to each other because that's just cosine of x plus pi. So you can actually view these two answers as shifted versions of one another. 
right? So if you want the derivative of sine of x to be equal to cosine x, then you'll choose this first one. If you want the derivative of sine of x to be equal to negative cosine x, then you're going to choose this second one. Now, why would you choose a derivative based on this particular property? So it really depends on what you're trying to model. And that's usually the question that we're going to go to when we start talking about fractional differential equations. So which one is more useful? And useful here is a subjective question. So let's assume we define useful as we choose this differential operator dx to be whichever, to be whichever gives us a local minimum at x equals zero as the result, right? So if we take the derivative of sine and we get cosine, well, we know cosine has a local maximum at x equals zero, and negative cosine has a local minimum at x equals zero. So if we want a derivative that has the property that it gives us a minimum at this point, x is equal to zero, then we clearly see that the second operator, that means dx, the b operator, works or is appropriate for this purpose. Okay, so therefore one can say that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. One could also say the derivative of sine x is negative cosine x. You really have to define, well, what do you mean by derivative? So this would be your classical or traditional, traditional first order derivative, derivative. And the second one is another derivative that has a particular property that generates a local minimum at x equals zero for the sine function. And it probably has some other properties for the other functions as well. So in terms of choosing the particular properties you want your differential operator to actually take when quote unquote fractionally differentiating functions, I'll actually leave that at that moment now just so you can sort of think about that over the next couple of videos or so. So for now, let us now switch gears to factorials because in terms of factorials and extensions of them, there are actually some parallel conversations that need to be had about them because the extensions of factorials and the extensions of derivatives actually have some common connection. So let's go ahead and explore that. So the first basic question that we definitely should already know the answer to is what is a factorial? So the factorial of a natural number n divided, denoted by an exclamation mark is defined to be equal to the product from k is equal to 1 to n of k. So that means this is going to be equal to 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up to n, where here n is a natural number. And some people will define it in the backwards version, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. And there's a special definition that a lot of people take as just a, a rule, and that's 0 factorial is equal to 1, and that allows several other properties to sort of, you know, look beautiful. Now, a little note that I want to mention is some abusive notation that I've seen a lot of people use. For example, you might see this type of thing, for example, one half factorial. So one half factorial has no natural meaning in its current form, in its current factorial form. factorial form, right? So when I say one half factorial, well, for the integer factorials, I sort of multiply all the integers from n down to one in spacings of one, right? Because I separate those by one, those by one, those by one, and then those by one. So if I do a half, technically half is the last half is the last half integer um, for which I will have until I get down to zero. So if I want to sort of approach that in the same natural manner and I ask, well, what do you think five halves factorial would be? Well, if we sort of approach this in the other way where we sort of subtract a half each of these times, then that would be equal to five halves times four halves times three halves times two halves 
times 1 half. And that's going to be equal to 5 factorial all over 2 to the power of 5. And that gives you one possible definition of uh, half integer factorials, right? So that would be, of course, a definition that you could take, right? So half multiplication or half products, I guess you could call them. So a nice little question that you could guess is, can we extend the domain of f, which is currently in union zero, and let's assume that f is defined by n union zero two uh, n via f of x is equal to f fact x factorial, right? Where x factorial is defined as above, right? So can we extend the domain of f to the set of real numbers, the whole subset, or some proper subset of the real numbers that's a little bit larger than that one? For example, negative integers, rational numbers, or half integers like we did up here, or just something a little bit bigger um, than the set of numbers. Then maybe this uh, factorial representation will have some other meaning. So the easiest way we can extend the domain is via linear extrapolation. So linear extrapolation, right? So let's look at the factorials just briefly. So here's zero, and let's assume that's one. So we know that zero factorial is equal to one, and one factorial is equal to one. Two factorial is equal to two. 3 factorial is equal to 6, and we can, of course, go upwards, right? So if we do linear extrapolation, then we're going to have a line connecting here, a line connecting there, a line connecting there. That line should look a little bit more steeper. Should look a little bit more like that. And then the points should get steeper and steeper and steeper. So if we extend this in a linear fashion, then one half factorial should be equal to the linear extrapolation or the linear extension of the factorial function, which would be equal to one. Well, why is that the case? Well, if we choose any number between zero and one, that's going to map to the left and right endpoints, which is of course equal to one. So we could say, moreover, the linear extension of the factorial function is gonna be equal to one for all x in the interval 0, 1. So therefore, one could say that what is 7 fourteenths factorial equal to via a linear uh, extension? That would be equal to 1. So what if I choose a point, say, in between 1 and 2, or between 2 and 3? So if I look between 2 and 3, so what's the slope of the line on the interval 2 to 3? So that's, of course, going to be equal to 6 minus 2 over 3 minus 2, which is going to be equal to 4. And the vertical intercept on the interval 2, 3 is going to be equal to 3 factorial minus the slope on that interval 2, comma 3. And then that's going to be times 3, for example. So that's going to be equal to 6 minus 4 times 3, which is going to be equal to minus 6. So one can then say that this line is given by the equation y is equal to 4x minus 6. So if you have each of these equations of these lines, then you can say that, for example, 2.5 factorial, if we extend it via the linear extrapolation approach, that's just going to be equal to L2.5, where L2.5 is going to be equal to 4 times 2.5 minus 6, which is going to be equal to 4. So that means 2.5 factorial can be extended to be equal to 4 via linear extrapolation. Now, is this the only extrapolation approach? Of course not, but there is one extrapolation of the factorial function that is quite popular. So let's go ahead and look at that and see what's so great about it. So the first star for extrapolating factorials to the real numbers that is a little bit more nicer compared to the linear extrapolation or possibly the quadratic or the cubic extrapolation approach is what we call the pi function. So the pi function. So the pi function denoted by pi of x is defined to be equal to the integral from zero to infinity of t to the power of x e to the minus t 
dt. So it's an integral defined function. So one may be tempted, well, is there a way that I can sort of re-represent this in terms of functions that I'm familiar with? And the answer is, of course, maybe. So if we use a u substitution, for example, we can let u be equal to t to the x, and therefore du is going to be equal to xt to the x minus 1 via the power rule. Our differential v would be equal to e to the minus t dt, with a v equal to negative e to the minus t. And then we can use integration by parts via this approach, and that means pi of x can be re-represented as minus t to the x e to the minus t, evaluated as t goes to infinity, as t goes to zero, plus the integral from zero to infinity of x t x minus one e minus t dt. One should be equal to uh, c, that as t goes to infinity, this exponential goes to zero. As t goes to zero, this polynomial goes to zero. Therefore, this first term is just going to be deleted once you evaluate that limit. Also, keep in mind that this is a t integral, therefore x is a constant as far as it cares, so that can be factored out. Therefore, the pi function can be re-represented as x times the integral from zero to infinity of t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt. But notice the only difference between this integral and the pi function is that x is just shifted to x minus 1. That means pi of x is equal to x times pi to the x minus 1. So what is pi x minus 1? Well, that's just going to be equal to x times x minus 1 times pi x minus 2. And that's going to be equal to x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 times pi of x minus 3. And you can continue this fashion onwards. So does this function look familiar? It should, because if x is a natural number, then this represents a factorial. So if x is equivalent to a natural number, let's call it m, that means pi of n is going to be equal to m times m minus 1 times m minus 2 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1, which is eventually going to give us the factorial. So what is so special about the pi function? So I leave this as an exercise to verify, but the domain of the pi function, at least the best domain that you can get out of it, is actually the set of real numbers except for negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so on. So if we look at the graph of the pi function, so let's actually start it off right here. So this is going to be negative 1. You can actually get a vertical asymptote there. So we already know that 0 factorial is equal to 1, 1 factorial is equal to 1, and then it's going to have that, that, and then it's just going to get bigger and bigger. So once you extrapolate these points with the pi function, you actually get this increasing or this convex function, which actually looks pretty nice. So that gives us an extension for the factorial function. So what properties does it have? Well, actually, a lot of people don't like analyzing the pi function because it doesn't have much symmetry in terms of its domain. A lot of people would prefer that this vertical asymptote be shifted over to the y-axis, and then you have practically a convex function in the uh, first quadrant of the Cartesian plane. So what a lot of people do is define a new function, which is called the gamma function, as a shifted version of the pi function. So we're going to define gamma of x to be equal to pi of x minus one. So it's shifted to the right one unit. So when we look at the gamma function, we're going to have this type of shape, right? So there's zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial, three factorial, and so on. Right? So this is gamma x and uh, y. So what is the domain of the gamma function? So that should be very easy to prove. So the domain of gamma is going to be equal to the set of real numbers except for 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and that gives us, you know, sort of what we want. So what is its connection to the factorial function? Well, if we use the same exact property as before, if n is a natural number, then gamma of m 
is equal to n minus 1, the quantity factorial. That is, gamma of n plus 1 and n factorial are equal to each other as long as n is a natural number. So a couple important analytical properties that you should be familiar with in terms of the gamma function is that, well, first off, why are we sort of looking at it? Well, we're trying to extend the factorials to a larger domain. So that means one half factorial can be extended to gamma of one half plus one, which is of course the same as gamma of three halves. Again, I emphasize extremely largely. This is not the only extension of factorials. I've given you one alternative, the linear extrapolation approach. We have the pi function, with a, which is a shifted version of gamma, but there are several, actually infinitely many other extrapolations of factorials that have other properties. Now, even though it's not the only extension of factorials, it is the only extension of factorials that has a set of three properties. And these three properties, so three special properties that make gamma a nice quote unquote choice for extending factorials are summarized in a theorem known as the bohr malarup theorem. So the bohr malarup theorem says this, that gamma is a unique function on zero to infinity that satisfies the following three properties. Satisfies the following three. The first is that gamma of one is equal to one. So that's practically the zero factorial is equal to one definition that a lot of people accept. Two, gamma of x plus one is equal to x gamma of x. That is, it has the factorial representation. Keep in mind, the gamma function is not the only function that has these two properties, but the gamma function is the only function that has these two properties with respect to this next property, that is gamma is logarithmically convex. So if you're familiar with convex functions from real analysis, then you should be relatively familiar with what it means for a function to be logarithmically convex. We're not going to get into the usefulness of the log convex property here, but keep in mind that the bohr malarup theorem says the gamma function is the only function that satisfies these three properties, where two of them serve the purpose of extending the factorials to a larger domain, where that larger domain is the set of real numbers except for zero and the negative integers. So with those things in mind, let's actually go ahead and evaluate um, a couple important values of the gamma function that is definitely going to be important for a lot of examples that you're going to encounter. So for example, what is gamma of one half equal to? So if we use the definition of the gamma function, that's gonna be equal to the integral from zero to infinity of t to the one half minus one e to the minus t dt. So if we use a substitution or actually, before we do that, let's actually rewrite this expression. One half minus one is gonna be negative one half. So that's gonna give us e to the minus t all over the square root of t uh, dt. So from here, what I want to do is do a substitution. I'm gonna be letting u be equal to the square root of t. Uh, that means du is gonna be equal to one over two square root of t dt. So if u is equal to the square root of t, that means t is equal to u squared. And if we solve this other equation for dt, that means dt is going to be equal to 2 square root of t du. That's going to cancel the square root of t on the bottom, and this exponential function is going to turn into something a little bit exciting. So that's going to turn into 2 times the integral of e to the minus u squared du. 
So what about the boundaries? So keep in mind the square root function is a monotonically increasing function. So when it's equal to zero, it's zero. When you plug in infinity, it's infinity. So the bounds are still going to be zero to infinity. So also remember from pre-calculus that e to the minus x squared is a symmetric function about the y-axis. So two times the integral from zero to infinity is actually equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the same exact function. So therefore, gamma of 1 half is going to be equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. Now I'm just going to briefly go over this little trick from calculus 3. But if gamma of 1 half is equal to that, that means gamma of 1 half, the quantity squared, is actually going to be equal to the double integral across r2 of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dx dy. So if we shift this integral to polar coordinates, that's going to give us the following integral. The integral, don't forget to square it, from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to infinity. So this first integral, that's our theta integral, and the second integral, that's our r integral in polar coordinates. And then we're going to have e to the minus r squared, because x squared plus y squared is r squared. And then the Jacobian of dx dy is r dr d theta. So we have r dr d theta. So once you go through this process, keep in mind that there is no theta here, so we can just write a 2 pi there. That's no big deal. So that's going to be equal to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of r e to the minus r squared dr, you should be able to easily do a u substitution with u being equal to r squared. And you should be eventually getting that this is equal to pi. So since gamma of 1 half squared is equal to pi, that means gamma of 1 half is equal to the square root of pi. And that's a very nice result. And you're like, well, okay, if I can find gamma of 1 half, is it possible that I can find this gamma of 3 halves thing that I'm trying to extend 1 half factorial to? And the answer is, of course, yes. And you can actually do that fairly easily. So remember, so recall, the gamma of x plus 1 is equal to x gamma x. It's one of those special properties that gamma function has. That means gamma of 3 halves which is actually the same as gamma of 1 half plus 1, is the same as 1 half times gamma of 1 half. So that means this is going to be equal to the square root of pi, the value we got for gamma of 1 half, all divided by 2 because of that 1 half. So that means what? That means 1 half factorial can be extended via the gamma function to gamma of 3 halves, which is equal to the square root of pi over 2. Keep in mind, if you just write this, that is not a unique statement. It's generally ambiguous because there are definitely several actually infinitely many extensions you can do, but gamma is usually the most famous or uh, popular of them all. So, of course, this answer is very beautiful, but there's actually a more beautiful answer that you should be able to prove. Um, that is a generalization of that. So, moreover, you should be able to show that n over 2 factorial can be analytically extended to gamma of n plus 1 half. That should be easy to verify. And you can show that this is equal to 2n the quantity factorial all over 4 to the power of m, n factorial times the square root of pi. Now that's a fun little exercise uh, that you can do in your spare time, but that is a generalization of this 1 half factorial is equal to square root of pi over 2 relationship. Now since we have sort of diverted from the main question of today, and that is what is fractional calculus, let us sort of bring all these things together, for example the extensions of functions, extensions of factorials, into the question of extending derivatives to arbitrary orders. So since we already know how to extend factorials with the gamma function, we can actually extend the power rule to arbitrary uh, positive real number orders very, very easily with that extension. So review or recall that the derivative of x to the power of m is going to be equal to n times x to the n minus 1. If we do the second derivative of this, that's going to give us what? 
it's going to give us n times m minus 1 times x to the m minus 2. You should be able to easily extend this using mathematical induction to the kth derivative of x to the n to be equal to n factorial divided by n minus k, the quantity factorial, times x to the n minus k. So remember what our main goal of fractional calculus is. It's our goal to extend k, which is naturally a natural number, to some subset of the real numbers. So the only thing that we really need to think about is how to extend this expression to a subset of the real numbers. So this first expression is not a big deal. Um, so that just leaves us with how to extend factorials to a subset of the real numbers, which we have already answered in at least two different ways. So what we can do is we can extend the alpha derivative of x to the power of n. We can define this to be equal to gamma of m plus 1 all over gamma n minus alpha plus 1 times x to the n minus alpha. So the only thing I've really done here is I've just replaced k with alpha everywhere I see k. And keep in mind that m factorial is equal to gamma n plus 1, which is the connection between factorials and gammas. So keep in mind, and it's extremely important to remember this, that this is not the only one. And actually, to some degree, it's not the best one either, but it at least matches the integer order relationships, so it's at least good for now. So let's look at a couple examples on how we can evaluate uh, a couple of the fractional derivatives of simple monomial expressions. Okay. So let's start off with the classical one. So the half derivative of x, for example. And let's assume that we're extending this via the gamma relationship. So that means this is going to be equal to gamma of 2 divided by gamma of 1 minus 1 half plus 1 times x to the 1 minus 1 half. So that means this is going to be equal to, so gamma of 2 is the same as 1 factorial, 1 factorial is equal to 1, so that's going to be 1 divided by 1 plus 1 is 2, and 2 minus 1 half is 3 halves. So that's going to give us gamma of 3 halves times x to the 1 half. Now it's very, very important. Remember what x looks like? x looks like a linear function from 0 to infinity. But notice the big issue here. Notice that the domain of x to the 1 half is not 0 to infinity. It's actually 0. It's not negative infinity to infinity, but 0 to infinity. So the domain has completely changed from one thing to another. And this poses one of the very first issues of fractional calculus that we eventually have to encounter. But if we sort of ignore those technicalities, we actually already know what the value of gamma of 3 halves is. That's just square root of pi over 2. So that means if we extend the fractional derivative of x via the gamma function extension, this is just going to be equal to 2 divided by the square root of pi times the square root of x, and that gives us a fractional representation for the half derivative of x. Now, another interesting property that we might be able to explore with this type of derivative extension and others is consecutive or recursive applications of this operator. So if I apply the half derivative to the half derivative of x, what will I get? So again, let us extend these operators via the gamma approach. So that's going to be equal to, so we have this 2 over square root of pi hanging out, and then we're going to have gamma of 1 half plus 1 all over gamma of 1 half minus 1 half plus 1 times x to the 1 half minus 1 half. So once we have this, what do we have? So 1 half minus 1, that's going to give us 0. 1 half plus 1, that's going to give us 3 halves. So this expression here is going to give us square root of pi over 2. And this 2 over square root of pi, pi over square root of 2, they're going to cancel out. And gamma of 1 is the same as 0 factorial, which is defined to be equal to 1. So we're just going to be left with this x to the 1 half minus 1 half term, which is the same as x to the power of 0. Now be very, very careful 
because keep in mind that this is equal to 1 as long as x does not equal to 0, right? So when we talked about the domain changing from minus infinity to infinity to 0 to infinity over here, it's actually an open bracket. And that is a very, very interesting thing because the natural domain of square root is actually closed bracket zero to infinity, but this actually needs to be an open circle because of this issue. Or you can keep it closed here and you can change it to an open circle once you change here. So that means this must be equal to one, where this one function is this one function. Right? So this is the consecutive half derivative of x. So it's not this one function. So it's not this one. So you should see a few of the subtleties in fractional calculus that we definitely have to be very, very careful for, which is why I make a couple of these uh, remarks about, you know, gamma is not the only extension of fractional derivatives and uh, factorials, and this is not the only possible representation for the fractional power rule, and the domains aren't necessarily behaving like they used to. So I'll just leave you with those things to sort of think about, and we'll explore several of them in the upcoming series. So I hope to see you in the upcoming videos, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.